Chapter 205, The Breakfast. Yes, it was to this individual that Maria Villiers was to be sacrificed. It was to him that the cold and selfish policy of Lord Rossville was about to consign a beautiful and artless and an amiable girl. Sir Cherry's mother had paid the debt of nature about a year previously, and the young baronet found himself the possessor of an immense fortune. Lord Rossville only looked upon his orphan niece Maria as an encumbrance while she remained single, or as a means of increasing the wealth, and in his idea the strength, of the family when she married. Sir Cherry had met her in the brilliant sphere of the West End society. He had courted her, and the moment Lord and Lady Rossville observed his attentions, they commanded her to receive them with, fl with favor. She, poor timid friendless girl, was half persuaded into the idea that the match was really to her advantage, and half bullied, for we can actually use no other term, into an acquiescence in the views of her guardian. Thus she had not dared to utter a negative when the insipid baronet had solicited her hand, and her silence being taken for a ready consent, the preliminaries were hurried on without any further reference to the inclinations or wishes of the victim." We have been painfully excited on your account, Sir Cherry Bounce, said Lady Ravensworth, advancing to receive the bridegroom. The truth was that my friend Silmax uh, insisted on my riding the new horse I bought yesterday, exclaimed the baronet, and as he don't seem to be very well broken in, the result was that I nearly got a broken head. I never saw such a guy on a horse before, strike me, said Major Silmax Dapper, who had followed his friend into the room. He would keep in advance of me the whole way, and although I called after him to rein in, strike him, he would not listen to me. It was that shouting and hurraying that frightened my horse, observed Sir Cherry, casting a sulky look towards Silmax. At all events, you are not hurt, and that is the essential, said Lord Rossville. Hurt? No, of course the good gentleman's not hurt, exclaimed Baron Tarkhamduff. It's nothing at all but an idea, a fancy. You know very well, sir, that you do not really exist, that you only think you do exist. Sir Cherry Bounce, to whom those words were addressed, cast so ludicrous a look of surprise mingled with dismay upon the philosopher that Major Silmax Dapper burst into an immoderate fit of laughter, so that Baron Tarkhamduff was for a moment disconcerted. Lord Rosville seized this opportunity to lead Sir Cherry Bounce toward Miss Villiers, who received her intended husband with a manner which, to the superficial observer, might appear excessive bashfulness, but which, to the penetrating eye, was the expression of blank, soul-crushing despair. "'I was just as timid with my first as Maria is,' whispered Mrs. Barry Manny to the Countess of Brazenface. "'With my second, I was a little more gay, and my third, "'Dear Mrs. Barry Manny, interrupted the Countess impatiently, "'pray do not talk to your seconds and thirds "'when here are my two youngest daughters "'who haven't even got their firsts.' Two footmen in gorgeous liveries now entered the room and threw open a pair of folding doors, thus revealing an inner apartment "'where the nuptial ceremony was to take place by special license.' Then Sir Cherry Bounce took Maria's hand and led her slowly into the next room, the Honorable Mrs. Wigmore attending her in the capacity of bridesmaids. The remainder of the company followed in procession, and now the bishop took his place near the table and opened the book, and the ceremony began. Pale as marble and almost insensible to what was passing around her, Maria Villiers heard a sort of droning mumbling, but could not distinguish the words, and yet the bishop read the prayers in a clear, distinct, and impressive manner. One of the bridesmaids whispered in Mariah's ear, and the young victim mechanically repeated the answer thus prompted, but she was scarcely aware of the tenor of what she had said. Every moment the scene became less comprehensible to her mind, and she was on the point of uttering a wild cry, so alarming was the confusion of her thoughts, when there was a sudden movement amongst the assembly. Warm lips touched her forehead for a moment and were instantly withdrawn, and then her ears rang with the congratulations of her friends." The chaos of her ideas was immediately dispelled, and the appalling truth broke suddenly on her. The ceremony was over, and she was a wife. Upon her marble brow, the kiss of a husband had been imprinted. By one of those strange efforts of which the soul is sometimes capable when the worst has arrived and the bitterness of death has passed, Maria recovered her presence of mind and even smiled faintly in acknowledgment of the congratulations which she received. That young lady seems very happy now, whispered the German philosopher to Mrs. Barry Minnie. But it is all nothing more than an idea. We're all an idea. That Reverend Bishop, this room, that book he was reading in, everything. Do you mean to persuade me, sir, asked Mrs. Barry Minnie with an indignant glance at Baron Torkemdeff, that it is all mere fancy on my part that I've had five husbands? If so, sir, all I can say is that I should like to have a sixth opportunity of putting your theory to the test. And with these words, the widow of five experiments of the marriage state joined the procession, which was now on its way to the breakfast room. 
The table in this apartment was spread with all the delicacies which were calculated to tempt the appetite of satiety. Sir Cherry thought it necessary to whisper some soft nonsense in the ears of his bride as he conducted her to a seat, and Maria turned upon him a vacant glance of surprise. Then suddenly recollecting the relation in which she stood towards him, her head drooped upon her bosom and she made no reply. <laughs> Poor girl, she's so miserable. Cherry whispered, Major Dapper, you are not half lively enough below you. You look like a fool, but I suppose you can't help it. Hold your tongue, Sil Max. Hold your tongue, Sil Max, returned Sir Cherry, coloring to such an extent that the deep red was visible beneath his light hair. You, you can't treat me like a child anymore. And now began the bustle of the breakfast table, and the excitement of the scene appeared to produce the most beneficial effects upon Lord Ravensworth, who did the honors of the table conjointly with Adeline, in a manner indicative of more gaiety and spirit than he had exhibited for some time. Lord Ravensworth is certainly improving, said the Countess of Brazen Face, apart to Mrs. Barry Many. My second use to... <laughs> I just realized! <laughs> Mrs. Very Many is a play on Very Many because she's had very many husbands. <laughs> this just keeps getting more ridiculous. <sighs> My second used to deceive me in the same manner was the reply also delivered in an undertone. He was always dying and always getting better for at least three years before he went off altogether. My fourth, oh, you have told me all about him before, hastily interrupted the countess, who was alarmed lest the widow should inflict upon her a narrative of oft-experienced tediousness. That very excellent bird, how you call him a pheasant? Ah, observed Baron Talcum Deaf to the young clergyman who, like a child, saw, heard, but said nothing. But after all, it is no use for to praise one thing or blame another, because they are each ideas and fancies. There really, there's no table, no pheasant, no wine, no peoples. It is all the imagination. And while the philosopher went on expatiating in this manner, the viands disappeared from his plate and the wine from the decanter near him with a marvelous rapidity, so that the young clergyman could not help muttering to himself, I wonder whether the baron's appetite is an idea also. Serafina whispered the Countess of Brazen Face to one of her daughters, if you look so much at Count Swindeliski, I shall be very angry. He has got no money and is not a match for you. There is the member of Buy Him Up whom Rhino, sitting on your right, and he is a wealthy bachelor. But dear mamma, returned Serafina, also in a whisper, he is at least sixty. So much the better, was the prompt reply. He is the easier to catch. Now mind your P's and Q's, miss. This maternal advice was duly attended to, and by the time he had tossed off his third glass of champagne, the member for buy him up cum Rhino had grown very tenderly maudlin towards the red-haired young husband hunter. Miss Bluestocken, dear, cried the elder Miss Wigmore, have you composed nothing appropriate for the present occasion, a sweet little poem in your own fascinating style? Oh, dear, Miss Wigmore, how unkind, said the literary young lady in, a, in an affected and languishing manner. I could not have believed it of you to appeal to me before so many. If I have told you in confidence, or if it be indeed generally known that the poetic nosegay was written by me, and if it had a very large circulation, I do not think it is fair to expect... Ah, oh, Miss Bluestocken, exclaimed Miss Wigmore, we are all aware that your pen is seldom idle. It is really quite provoking to find oneself known to fame, said the literary lady, with increasing affectation of manner and in a drawling, insipid tone. I wish I had never written at all, not that I have ever been induced to acknowledge the authorship of that novel which was so successful last year, the Royal Fiddlestick, I mean. No, but the time may come, and here the literary lady shook her head in so mysterious a way that if she intended to be incomprehensible, she certainly was most successful in the endeavor. Who is that lady, inquired the bishop of Lord Rosville. Miss Bluestock, the celebrated authoress, was the reply. Oh, said the bishop, in a dry, laconic way, which proved that, however celebrated Miss Bluestocken might be, the trumpet of her own renown had never sounded in his ears before. Talk of poetry and novels, exclaimed the German baron. What are all of them to the researches of the philosophy? Was your lordship ever read? Has your lordship ever read my grand work on the ideality of the universe? I cannot say that I have ever read it, sir, answered the bishop with a frown. I have heard of it, sir, and I considered its doctrines to be opposed to the Bible, sir. Believe it is in 14 large volumes, sir? Well, sir, then all I have to observe upon it is that so many quartos are themselves too substantial to be a mere idea. <laughs> the bishop's like, if everything really is a mere idea or a fancy, you wouldn't have written so much about it. But they are an idea, exclaimed the baron angrily. They do not really exist, my lord, in spite of what your lordship shall say. Everything is an idea. We ourselves are walking, moving ideas. There's no such thing as joy, no such thing as pain. They are mere sensation. 
At this moment, the learned philosopher started from his seat with a yell of agony and began stamping on the floor in a furious manner. The fact was that while he was gesticulating in order to bestow additional emphasis on the enunciation of his principles, his hand raised in the air came in contact with a cup of coffee which a domestic was about to place before the young clergyman, and a scalding fluid was poured forth on the bald head and down the back of the philosopher. Pray do not mind it, sir, said the bishop dryly. It is merely an idea. Yes, it is an idea, no doubt, said Baron Torquemdeff as he wi wiped his head with his pocket handkerchief while the domestic murmured an apology and slunk away. But the idea was come in the unpleasant shape that nothing against my doctrine, thousand devils, how did it burn? And particularly disconcerted, the learned man sank back into his seat where he consoled himself with a renewed application to the decanter near him. He's like, yes, it's only an idea, but it's an idea that hurts. <laughs> I thought there was no such thing as pain, buddy. <laughs> Meantime, Count Swindeliski was rendering himself very amiable to the Honorable Miss Helena Sophia Alexandrina Wigmore, next to whom he sat. Poland, then, must be a very beautiful country, said the young lady, duly impressed by a most graphic description which the Count had just terminated. Very fine, very fine, returned the fascinating foreigner. The ancestral castle of the Swindeliski is very, is very grand, it touches the clouds, so long that when you do stand at the and you shall not see the other, so wide that horses shall always be kept saddled for to cross the court. My father was, my father kept 3,000 dependents. Me not, I did not choose to spend the revenue in that way. I only may keep a thousand. You can, and can you prefer England to your own beautiful country, inquired Miss Helena Wigmore. I shall not prefer England, answered the Count. I shall choose a wife of the English ladies. They are very beautiful, very fine, very clever. Then I will take my wife to Poland, where she shall be a very great lady indeed. And as he spoke, he threw a tender glance at his fair companion. But Miss Helena Sophia Alexandrina Wigmore knew full well that every word the Count uttered concerning his fortune and castle was false. She was, however, too polite not to seem to believe him, and she was moreover pleased at engrossing the attentions of the handsomest man in the room. She therefore permitted herself to flirt a little with him, especially as her mother was not present to control her actions. But like all young ladies in fashionable circles, she was too astute and, ver and wary to entertain the least idea of a more serious connection. Breakfast was now over, a carriage and four drove up to the front of the mansion, and the hour of departure had arrived for the happy couple. Mariah withdrew for a few moments in company with Lady Ravensworth and the two bridesmaids, and when she returned, she was dressed for traveling. Happy fellow, whispered Major Dapper to his friend, below you. Foolish Silmax, returned Cherry Bounce. I am really very happy, except that cursed wide on the fast trotting horse. Goodbye, I shall write to you within a few days. The farewells were all said, and Mariah resigned her hand to him, who was about to bear her away from the hall. She wept not, she sighed not, but despair was written on her marble visage, though none present could read that somber and melancholy language. I have directed Flora to accompany you, whispered Lady Ravensworth, and you can keep her all together if you choose. Should this young woman whom you have hired make her appearance, I will retain her and give her a trial. But what is her name? I had forgotten to ask you. Mariah gave an answer, but there was such a bustle in the room at the moment and such a confused din of many voices that the name escaped Adeline's ears. Mm, I think I know who it's going to be. I have a theory. All right. Sir Cherry at the same instant led Mariah towards the stairs, and in a few minutes the carriage containing the newly married pair was rolling away from Wavensworth Hall on its journey to Cherry Park in Essex. I wish I was bound on a similar trip with a sixth thought Mrs. Berrymenny as she watched from the window of the, de the departure of the carriage. I wish I could get off my eighth and ninth as easily as the Rossvilles have done with Mariah, thought the Countess of Brazenface, but I am afraid that the member for buy em up cum rhino will not bite. I wish I had not eulogized the single state in my poems, thought Miss Bluestocken with a profound sigh. I wish I shall soon find an agreeable lady that will make me the very happiest of men, said Count Swindeliski. Swindle. <laughs> Just figured that one out because he's lying about it. Oh my gosh. <gasps> After all, said Baron Torquemdeff, who had recovered his equanimity by dint of frequent libations, the marriage is only an idea, a fancy like any other thing. That handsome chariot does not actually exist. It is only an idea. And that loving pair who shall sit in it are only ideas as well. Uh, everything is an idea. I am an idea. And that Lord Bishop with the lawn sleeves is only an idea. Where is Lord Ravensworth? inquired Adeline of a, dom of a domestic. 
His lordship felt suddenly unwell a few moments ago. My lady has retired to his cabinet. Ah, a reaction, a recurrence to the pipe, murmured Lady Ravensworth, a cloud passing over her brow. Please, your ladyship, said the servant, a young woman has just arrived from London. She says that she was hired by Miss Villiers, I beg pardon, Lady Bounce, and that an accident to the vehicle in which she came to the hall has delayed her. Oh, she is to remain with me, returned Adeline. Tell her that I will make take her into my service on the same terms that were arranged between her and Lady Bounce. She is to replace Flora. Very good, my lady, and the servant was about to retire. One moment, William, said Adeline, beckoning him back. Did this young woman mention her name? For as I am not yet, for as I am, <laughs> did this young woman mention her name? For as yet I am really ignorant of it. Yes, my lady, answered the domestic. Her name is Lydia Hutchinson. And the servant withdrew. I knew that's who it was. Lydia Hutchinson murmured Lady Ravensworth, turning deadly pale and tottering to a seat. Are you unwell, Adeline? inquired Lady Rossville, approaching her daughter. No, a sudden indis indisposition. It is nothing, replied Adeline. And she hastened from the room. Ooh. Okay, I thought that might, might be who it is. <gasps> okay, we'll see what happens.